I'm Izzy Barrett. I'm the Artistic Director of the National Youth Jazz Collective. Welcome to our hashtag National Youth Jazz Wednesday, our regular get together with young musicians and different members of the jazz scene, uh, including sometimes promoters and funders. So a very diverse mix. Today, who, what's, where's Nick, our programme manager? Nick, what have we been Hello, up good to evening. today? Because you've been busy, haven't you? It's been and incredibly newsletter, busy. Newsletter's been okay. going out. So what, what sort of things have you been getting ready for this newsletter? So we're getting ready this amazing audition tour that's going to be happening in April time, um, early April, well actually just at the end of March, so from the 27th of March to about the 16th of April, we're going to be uh, all, all well going around the country uh, auditioning uh, NYJC Summer School for 2021. And, uh, and then also, while you've been doing that, I've been frantically looking back at the videos of the summer school, coming up with some ideas of we're actually creating a program. Uh, well, I think it's now called a blended learning program where we're going to have some online teaching videos as well as meeting person to person. But it's great news about the vaccine and really feel. And I think we might have just lost Izzy there, but yeah, great news about the vaccine and seeing how that can kind of really help us. Bring, for, bring things forward and, and especially we can take that into consider, consideration for the future planning. Um, we're really hoping by next uh, summer that the summer school will definitely be going ahead. We do indeed. And talking of which, um, it's one of our guests today has been a key member of the summer school and the short course, the Creative Leadership, Leadership Ensemble, I'll slow down, and also working at King's Place. So I, I'd really like to welcome to the stage one of our first guest artists, which is Nikki Yo. Nikki. Hello. Hi. Hello. <laughs> really great to see you. And you've, you've actually been seeing quite a lot of NYJC alumni recently as well because of your involvement in the BBC Young Jazz Musician of the Year. Absolutely, yes. Um, I haven't been uh, teaching on your courses for several years now, so it was nice to see some of the young people that I'd met, like in 2017, I think. I met um, Alex and Ralph, who were both at the competition competing for the finals. And then um, in the uh, previous round for the... Uh, Semi-finalists, there was also Asher and Emma and Roella as well. Um, oh, so it's great, four out of five. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't involved in the semi-final process. That's probably a really good question to ask Zoe, because I know she was one of the judges on, on the Oh, panel. great. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, um, we'll ask Zoe in a moment. I was just wondering about um, your trio that you played with the uh, on the BBC Young Jazz Mus Musician of the Year that you had your own trio that was actually the house band I was wondering whether you might tell us a bit about it and whether we might even share a little bit of the performance that you did at Ronnie Scott's. Yeah sure um, actually it's really weird because at the time when I created that band as a um, consciously didn't want to call it a trio because at the time everybody was like you know Nikki Yo trio or you know Izzy Barrett quartet it was very sort of unimaginative mm, yeah. like, uh, so um, I just was one of the few people, a little bit like some of my contemporaries, like um, Quite Sane and um, J Life. We called our band a band name, which was kind of quite radical in the 90s, actually. We've been to a band for a long time. Initially, it was myself and Michael Mondesi, who currently still plays in the band, a fantastic, incredible genius bass player, I have to say. And um, Keith LeBlanc, who is oh. from America. He's uh, from... Uh, Tack Heads, uh, Sugar Hill, um, he's just like the most incredible drummer. It was like us three that started the band together because we were on the road with Nana Cherry at the time and we used to just jam. And because I was doing a lot of composing, as I still do, and they were like, let's play some of your tunes. And so we got together. And uh, then there was one gig that Keith couldn't make because his wife was just about to have their first child, literally a bit early. So we were in Barcelona. So uh, the only other person who I could think to call was... Uh, Mark Mondesi. So in a way, Mark's been there from the right, the very beginning as well. So we've um, always had that connection. So yeah, we've been a band since 1993. Wow. And then both of them are coming in. They're going to be joining us next Wednesday. So. Fantastic. Yeah, we're at, we're at Ronald Scott's on January the 4th, um, 2021. We've got a live gig. And it's <laughs> So we're like, oh man, that's really good. So the BBC Young Jazz was just like great to get together and play. And then we're going to just like really stretch out at Ronnie's in January. So it's going to be a great way to see in the new year. And boy, do we need to see in that new year. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh, it's definitely not going to be a year like this year's been. There's lots of 
positive news what with the virus uh, the vaccine and yeah i think 2021 is going to turn things around for us might take a little bit of toing and froing at the beginning but certainly from sort of may onwards um, i think things will hopefully feel like they're back to normal i was wondering whether you might tell us about the piece um, that's that you recorded on the uh, youtube uh, video and then maybe then nick would actually uh, play it for us oh, so that we can hear it. Um, that is, a, it's, it's a, basically there's a story to it and it's about two bears and it's a very brief synopsis of the story because I've, I can waffle on for ages. But I wrote this tune um, a long time ago when I was 19 and um, basically it's about two bears in a forest, a man bear and a woman bear. The man bear sees the woman bear and he wants to dance with her but um, he goes over to her and realises he can't ask her because he's a bear and bears don't talk. She gets up and she starts to dance which in bear language means, would you like to dance? And when she gets up, she's a lot taller than him. She's a bit bigger, but he, he loves, he's like about the inner bear. He doesn't care what she looks like, even though he thinks she's gorgeous anyway. So anyway, she, her dance steps are heavier than his because he's a tiny little bear. And because he's a gentleman, he changes his dance steps. So you see all of this in the piece. So the little bear asking a question, then her big dance steps. And because he's a gentleman, he changes his steps to fit, fit with hers. And then they fall in love. I know. And when I was 19, that was kind of the end of it. Like the improvised section was about them falling in love. But, you know, as you get older, you realise life changes and stuff. And sometimes it goes a bit explosive and all of that. Even you realise that when you're younger too. But the whole thing changes. Every improvisation changes as it should do with every jazz tune, but particularly this one with the vibe of the audience. So if they're all projecting that the bears are going to split up, then it might go into that kind of energy. But if they're project projecting that they're going to live happily ever after, it might play out really sweetly. I can't actually remember what happens at this Ronnie's one. It probably change again when we play at Ronnie's in January. But um, have a have a, check it out. I, I can't actually remember, so I'm watching this again. Really, and you very you very kindly played it when we did the um, tenth birthday concert at King's Place as well. You very kindly oh, came to play. Oh, it then. That was a few years ago now. So you guys, 2017, like, oh. 2017. That was yeah. That was the same year that you did the Purcell summer school as well and the short course yeah and I think we've done a little bit of creative leadership then so we do we tend to rotate people around every three years and so that that year is now coming back around again so I think there might be an email wending its way towards you about um, 2021 because obviously you this year you guys are nearly 15 how exciting is that a couple more years yeah well, so we've got a 15th birthday in 2022 and right. so there'll be another festival then as well. And obviously this year was a bit different. We had to revise it all because of being online. So a lot of what we'd originally put in place um, was moved, either postponed to next year or uh, changed. But uh, we will be in touch very soon because we've uh, got some ideas to talk to yourself and Zoe about. But while we, um, we could even have a little chat behind the video, uh, maybe Nick, might you um, press play and let's have a, maybe the first sort of three and a half minutes. That'd be lovely. Dance of the two small bears. <laughs> I don't know why I wore that thing. <laughs>
Brutal. Is there, is there a fade button on, on YouTube? <laughs> that was fantastic. Great energy. Um, you're still on mute, I think. I'm not sure we can hear you yet, Lovie. Oh, that's it. That's technology Brilliant. for you. Because <laughs> so um, I've got some fantastic questions that the young musicians are going to come and ask in a minute. And they're all based around sort of the, from the perspective of a player. And as a composer, I just wondered if I could ask you about when you're writing music especially for your own bands, um, how much of it have you got, how much of the compositional process has got those particular players in mind? Um, usually always, like, mm. it's always about the characters who I'm playing with, unless it's a commission for people that I don't know. And then it's about what do I really want to get from that particular instrument? So mm. then it's more of a kind of a question of the timbre and all of those, you know, compositional concepts that you would take into mind in general so if you're writing for people that you don't know mm. but um what's interesting as well is like i mean i usually always compose a piece that's a piano piece and then arrange it for the rest yeah. of the band but then something, sometimes it might be that i'm here in a groove and it might be that i'm here in a certain bass line or it might be that i'm starting with a drum pattern so it also depends on where it's coming from but then i'm also very open to um, who I'm playing with because obviously I want their musical personality to shine you know yeah it's never just about yourself as a band leader yeah it's always got to be about everybody's uh, equal sum of the of the whole part so you know if Mark or Mike if they hear in, if they hear something in a certain way then they, they could feel free to articulate that and if I don't like it I would say something but usually that's that's never required because they're both incredible and um, would you ever develop a piece so where it's not actually fully complete, where you would sort of take it and try a few things yeah. out first? No. So you just... Never. My, my, my music is, tends to be always through composed from start yeah. to finish with very specific areas for improvisation. If we decide to take the scenic route as opposed to the motorway during that mm -hmm. performance, that's absolutely cool and to be expected as well because we're jazz musicians. Mm. So, you know, if we feel like taking it more out or we want to go we go into a different kind of feel a different groove we're open because as long as we're in tune and we go there together mm -hmm. and we're not swapping in against each other then it's going to be great it's going to feel good and everyone's going to hear it as good but once it becomes something like oh i want to go here i want to go there i don't know there's got to be someone who's a leader and i think as a composer i'm very specific about what i really want i mean right also, because, also coming to like for me, like if someone's playing a melody, if I'm writing a melody for like a saxophone player and I wrote, I write a, a dotted minim and I want it to be a dotted minim or I want it to be, uh, you know, a 16th after the beat, I'm very specific about where I want that rhythm, how I want it articulated because um, phrasing to me is a very important uh, component of music as right. an improviser and as a musician, you know, so um, I, I, I quite like it to be played a certain way, you know. Brilliant. Um, and uh, I was wondering whether we might actually welcome our second guest, who is somebody that you work with a lot um, to the stage, uh, whether we could well, please everybody welcome Zoe Rahman. Hello, Zoe. Hi. Hi, Nikki. Hi, Izzy. I was wondering, because um, yourself of being a pianist and a composer as well, if, if you, what the questions we were just sort of sharing then, whether that resonates. Do you, do you ever take things incomplete to your answer? Because you've got your own bands as well as being commissioned. Do you ever sort of take things to explore or do you take pretty, you know, complete compositions? Actually, it's kind of a mixture. It's really interesting listening to Nikki talk about how she composes. It's a similar way to me in a lot of respects, like I sometimes have. I, I do write for the piano primarily and then arrange for other instruments. But um, yeah, similar to her, I quite often hear a groove first or a bass line first. So we're coming from that similar sort of perspective. But um, in terms of the openness, yeah, sometimes, as with Nikki, it's, I have a very clear idea of what I want people to play. 
So, um, like Nikki said, a more through composed thing, but quite often I'll just um, see what the musicians bring to my music. I quite like that about composing in a sort of jazz context that, you know, the musicians I work with bring their own energy and their own ideas. Like Nikki said, it's, it's still my composition, but um, yeah, I just like to see what they do with it. It has its own life beyond me in a way. And so when I play my tune, when Nikki and I play our tunes with each other, it's amazing to hear what Nikki does on my music. It's still my composition and it's still Nikki's compositions, but it kind of takes it to another place that you're not necessarily expecting or thinking about when you're writing it. And sometimes I do like um, on a couple of albums, I think my album, I can't remember what it's called now, Kindred Spirits, that album, there was a track that was, it was just free improvisation in the studio. I had a basic idea of a very, very short kind of theme. And then it was just very open. I just wanted to see what happened in the moment in the studio, see what all the musicians came mm -hmm. up with. So yeah, I kind of write in different ways, like Nikki, for different situations and different people, yeah. So with that in mind, then the two of you came together. Nikki, I'm wondering if you might um, explain to everybody how that journey happened of the two of you coming together now playing as a duo. I mean, um, it's, it's an interesting piano duo can be, it can either be incredible or it can be a bit lame. And I've heard like, <laughs> it's a difficult thing to, it is true. It's kind of a difficult thing to kind of get right because it's, it's you know, a lot of the same sort of sonority, but with two different, it, it, you can get in each other's way. So, um, Pizza Express invited me to do uh, to join them for their two piano festival and asked me who I'd like to play with. And immediately I was like, yeah, Zoe. Because, um, you know, Zoe and I have always, we, we've always really got on really well as um, contemporaries. And I've always loved Zoe's playing and likewise love what Zoe brings to my compositions. And so I just wanted to explore both of our, um, our, our playing styles and also as, as both as composers, to explore our material. So we only play our material mm -hmm. on the show. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the only other piece we've done of someone else is McCoy Tyner's because he passed away. Oh um, yeah. yeah. And we were gonna play a McCoy Tyner one out. I think on the last gig that got cancelled right Zoe because of Yeah, COVID. that's the last time I saw you Nikki and we were I rehearsing that, that, weren't we? I can't believe it. It was a year ago, was it? I can't remember. It March. Was in, it was in March, but oh. it, actually a year ago was our last actual gig. As actual gig. December the 6th in Southampton was the no. last. Oh, because of I only know that because I was doing my tax return and I saw it. In the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so when, when you first got together, was it a certain amount of time that you were going to play for at the Pizza Express? Was the set? That... Yeah, there was two sets. Yeah, and also, sorry. Um, yeah, we both recorded solo piano albums. That's and right. so we were playing material from that. And so that was fantastic because it was really liberating. I think for Nikki and I, both of us, like when you're doing solo piano, I know Nikki on her album, she's, you, you overdubbed yourself, didn't you? On, I overdubbed um, on, the, on the tune that's written for two pianos. Exactly. And it's written yeah. for six pianos because somehow yeah. I couldn't manage 12 hands. I just don't yeah. have oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, And same with me, you know, I hear stuff. I'm like, oh, I wish I could just do that. And then playing with Nikki, suddenly I could do all those things. Like between us, it was like hearing this other piano. It was it was so amazing just to hear your compositions played in, in sort of how you conceive it in your head, but you can't physically do it. But to have another musician there, fantastic Nikki, who I've been a complete fan of. You were talking about the 90s. I was a fan in the you know, early 90s. I used to come and watch her play and I, I just loved her compositions and her music and her style. And the fact she was a, a woman leading her own band you know, and I needed it, you know, as a woman in jazz, I needed that role model at the time. I think that was really important for me. Absolutely. And like getting to play with her and doing these gigs as two pianos, it's just a dream, you know, it's just fantastic. So Nikki, might, might you introduce the video? Cause we, and then we could um, actually, I think there's a, we can let the whole thing run. I think it's two minutes long. It would be wonderful to now hear the, the duo maybe explaining what the piece is and where it was recorded. That'd be wonderful. Um, is, is this the little the little clip of Zoe and I? Um, yeah. So it was, actually, it was a year ago. So the sixth of December in Southampton, Turner Sims Concert yeah. Hall, which is a fantastic spot, and um, that was our last concert. I remember they wanted to put a Christmas tree on the show. We were like we're making a video, but they had to move the Christmas tree out. The way. <laughs> <laughs> 
I was a bit sad because like we both you know I like Christmas Zoe likes Christmas Likewise. But, <laughs> but this is just like a kind of a little um edit a little video edit I think it's like a one minute long kind of little thing of um me and Zoe playing um yeah some of our tunes so it's uh have a, check it out I can't remember what's on there actually nor can I <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we'll hand it over to Nick and we'll, uh, we'll enjoy two minutes of wonderful duo playing. need you guys to sing along. Are you up for that? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> That's what we did. There you go. <laughs> So as well as playing in the duo together, there's another thing that you've got in common, which is both of you have, have worked with Courtney Pine, who is somebody that is a real significant uh, character and, and I think very involved in lots of different sort of formative periods that people have had during their sort of apprenticeship as well as working with professionals, you know, in uh, all ages. But I was just wondering, uh, Nikki and Zoe, if you might sort of share with us a bit about Courtney and, and his, what role he's played in your musical journey. So Nikki, maybe first. I was going to let Zoe go for it. Oh, so that's very nice. <laughs> um, I actually, can ahead. I take one? Well, my last actual gig um, before the very first lockdown in, in March was with Courtney in Shoreditch Town Hall. Yeah. And it's, it was a duo project that we recorded an album a couple of years ago now, um, bass, clarinet and piano. Mm. And we toured that quite a lot. Um, my son was born very... <laughs> sort of around that time and Courtney was like well you know you could still make this album and come on tour and it was it was fantastic for me because Nikki you know as a, a, a mum it's very hard to keep mm -hmm. kind of playing and gigging and keep all those juggling all those things and so yeah. that was a really fantastic project for me um, to have and also as a piano player um, I, I played in Courtney's band in various incarnations with uh, a larger setup you know bass drum violin, viola, um, and but to just pair it right down to piano and bass clarinet, I learned a huge amount just being on stage with him, that connection, and he gave me loads of space. I mean, when he stopped playing, it's just me, <laughs> you know? So it's like a real opportunity um, for me to explore all this sort of sonorities of piano and interacting with him, how he interacts with the audience, like his vibe on stage is immense. Like, you know, you can just learn so much. Um, Jim just being in that space with him and also having his support, you know, as a musician, um, he understands the music business, he understands like what it means for me as a, a, a woman in, in jazz, uh, instrumentalist, not singer, um, he understands um, like kind of how hard it's been really as an artist to exist in the jazz world and so he's been hugely supportive of me and encouraging and just he has a lot of advice. He's kind of wise. He's quite a wise person, yeah. you know, and to have that support from someone um, of that stature and who has, you know, vast jazz, jazz knowledge and kind of um, experience, you know, is really helpful to an artist like myself, you know, when you're in those moments of maybe self-doubt or, you know, trying to connect with other people. Um, you know, because the jazz community it is a community, but within that, there is sort of kind of different mm -hmm. elements, different kind of groups of people. Um, I've always been a slight outsider, I have to admit. Um, so, you know, it's just good to connect with people. And Courtney's been a real support to me on that level. I don't know, Nikki, about you. Um, yeah, likewise. I mean, I just have to say, Courtney's always, he was championing women jazz musicians before it was hip, you know, before um, it became like, you know, a trendy thing to have a woman in your band. I mean, he's always been a supporter. I met Pine 
sorry, Courtney Pine, OBE. <laughs> <Real Courtney Pine, laughs> you see. I met him when I, when I was 18. Um, I went to the Tomorrow's Warriors Jam session that wasn't actually called the Tomorrow's Warriors Jam session at the time. It was New Troop Jam session on a Saturday at Jazz Cafe. And um, there was a jam session and basically the keyboard player, piano player, got a fit of nerves. He was very, very good, this guy who was going to sit in. So and he, he left the building. And so Gary Crosby jumped on the mic and he said, listen, he said, um, there needs to, we, we're missing a piano player for the jam session. If you want to come and sit in, we're going to play a blues, but you need to be able to cut it. Otherwise, don't bother. You know, and Gary was quite kind of like straight to the point. <laughs> so I like him. I am definitely not getting up there. That's not happening. And then all my mates were like, go on, go on, you should go, you should go. And they were about to play. And uh, Trevor Watkiss was about to play. He was like the, the uh, house pianist, like with new troupe, very good piano player. And he's about to play and he's really tall. The stage is really tall. And I like tapped on his shoulder, which I had to step on my tiptoes to tap on his shoulder because he's quite tall. <laughs> and I said, actually, I changed my mind. I said, can I sit in? And he was like, woo. And then he got up and he was very, very kind and let me sit in. It's quite big, you know, you're about to play, you let someone sit in. So then uh, throughout that jam session, I'm comping behind Courtney and it was Steve Williamson, awesome, fantastic, incredible genius British com uh, composer and saxophone player. Lonnie Plaxico from the States was on bass. Uh, Cameron Pierre, who was in Courtney's back. Like it was a heavyweight jam session, all these, all these great guys. And Pine was like looking at me over his glasses. And then I started taking a solo and he continues to look at me and play saxophone a little bit and look at me over the glass. And I thought, man, he's going to tell me to give it up. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to say to me, you need to stop. And yeah, I've got no chance of being a jazz musician. So I just felt like, even though the audience was applauding, I'm like, oh, they're applauding because I'm the only girl on stage. I had all these like insecurities about it and nerves about it. And I was about to leave and Gary, come up behind me and he tapped me on the shoulders goes excuse me we didn't know each other really then he goes excuse me he said um Courtney wants to talk to you in a dressing room and I thought okay he's definitely gonna tell me to give up a hundred percent and I said all right then and so we went up to the dressing room and then he's like the first thing he said to me he said where are you coming from and I didn't really know how to answer that I was like musically like do I live in London or and anyway he took my number and a few months later I was on uh, actually doing some gigs in Denmark with this arts organisation that me and Zoe used to go to called Weekend Arts College. Yeah. And um, Courtney called my landline and got to speak to my mum. And uh, it was at a time when my mates used to phone up and pretend that they were like Madonna's management and my mum would just hang up on them. So he said, hi, this is Courtney Pine. And my mum's like, yeah, whatever. She put the phone down <laughs> the phone back and he said, I wanted to book up some gigs and off Ooh. it went. Yeah, it's a real fairy fairy tale story, but it actually happened. And um, then I was on the road depping for Becky and Steleku, and then I joined several bands. And I was in the Courtney's band for several years now, and it was brilliant to the young musician to go in the deep end and do proper organised gigs, proper proper tour management. You know, you got paid well. All of those things were just you know set the bar higher for my expectations as a, a, a person who's going to have a career in jazz. Mm -hmm. And I think that's between all of us, that's something that we really care passionately about, about making sure that the environment that we're in yeah. is really, you know, welcoming and facilitating and no competitiveness. Um, and we've, you know, worked really hard with, in NYJC to make sure that everybody feels, you know, collegiate and supportive of each other. It was lovely to see in the Young Jazz Musician of the Year, you know, five of the alumni were four of the five alumni were female, um, th three in the semi-finals and then one in the final. So we'll talk a little bit about the BBC Young Jazz Musician of the Year in a moment, but um, I'm wondering whether we might actually welcome some of the young musicians to the stage. And I think it feels now a natural time to actually unleash their questions, all yeah. of which are really lovely. And they follow on very nicely from what we've just talked about. So um, could we please welcome to the stage, first of all, Leo. Hi. Hi Leo, nice to see you. So I think your first question, um, I would suggest that we ask it to both and maybe if Zoe answers first and then Nikki afterwards, it's a great one for both of them. So off you go, Leo. Well, I was just curious, like when you were our age applying to conservatoire, what were you doing musically? And if you could give yourself some advice, what would it be to your younger self? Oh gosh. Well, actually I was studying classical music Although I wanted to be a jazz piano player, I went to the like Royal Academy like every Saturday. I, I was brought up in Sussex, so I used to travel up on a train and go to London every Saturday 
have classical piano lessons and then I went to university so I studied classical music at Oxford University um, so the jazz thing I came to quite late although I was listening um, and yeah I think for me I kind of in a way I wish I'd pursued jazz a bit sooner in a way um, and taken it a bit more seriously when I was younger so I'd say to my younger self do a bit more practice <laughs> and jazz and listen to a lot more jazz I think that's what it would be for me but I, I you know it's very hard to give advice from you know the other side um, I think you've just got to do what you believe in what you love doing and if if jazz is what it is then you really just immerse yourself in it and yeah you can study other things and uh, you know apply to colleges apply to do other subjects but if your love and your heart is with jazz it, it, it will find you'll find it and it will find you yeah brilliant Thank yeah you. um that's a lovely 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 answer i love the fact of you going to london on the train that's so like it's, what a commitment to music man but when that's i was 11 a... like i can't believe yeah. my parents let me do that but i was with other, yeah. other older children but yeah I'm sorry it was back in the day you know oh. um i d actually didn't go to conservatoire i didn't uh, go to university i uh, finished my a levels and i decided to take a year out now i'm, I'm from a very working class family so that was like that was called what the what do you think you're doing you need to get a job rather than <laughs> taking a year out i was just kind of like following like oh i have any year out a year out from what I didn't really know i didn't know where I, where I was going all i wanted to do was was play the piano so i just practiced loads and actually during that period which is a sort of year out that is a time i met courtney in fact, I went to Ronnie Scott's almost every night because back in the day, you could get a musician's union membership for about, I don't know, 15 quid a year or something, or 20 quid yeah. or something. And then you would pay 15 pounds for Ronnie's and you could get into Ronnie's. Initially, it was for a pound every yeah. time. A pound. Per, and it was four shows. It would be like a great support act, great main act. And then they'd do it again, support and then the yeah. main. It wasn't a late show. It was like, support main support main yeah yeah it was wicked yeah. and because i don't i i'm you know i've been i'm raised born and raised in um islington so that was just a bus ride or a bike ride for me to go down there so ronnie scott's was literally my university i'd hear all of the greats so i actually cr kind of created my own jazz course in that sense <laughs> because um you know you yeah. go you go i mean when betty carter was playing and she had like you know eric harland was in the band jason moran you know all of those cats and or even before incarnations of it, before Craig Handy and uh, Cyrus Chestnut on piano. I mean, you know, you're going to hear incredible music every night, the legends. So I've always said Ronnie Scotts was my university. And, you know, no. you know and, and then there was such a vibe there because all the musicians would hang out there. Yeah. And um, then we'd, we'd go and like, we'd either play or we'd meet up the next day and we'd go to the premises and we'd have a little jam because you could hire a room for quite cheap. If you booked on the day, you all put in like a fiver, you could all play together. So that was really the whole vibe. Nowadays, it's a, it's a lot more like, you know, you have the facility, but there weren't really that many courses. I should have gone because it was free back in the day for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> <Definitely> free. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, uh, the... Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have like I'd go and hear, go and listen to absolutely, Nikki. I totally agree. You know, any opportunity I got to go and hear any live jazz, I was there. You know, so yeah, I was hanging out a lot of Ronnie's as well. Not as much as you because I didn't live in London, like you know. But um, yeah, this is like you know, Chicho Valdez from Irakiri, an incredible Cuban pianist. I mean, his chops are insane. He's got like this serious action, but really, really fast, and it doesn't give up. Like the whole action is like proper proper clean but proper strong but really fast a great composer i i mean i approached him i was so faced like, so much front i'd be like excuse me can i get a piano lesson from you and he didn't even charge me he's like come to ronnie's ronnie would let us just there was another piano in the upstairs room another grand piano and we just go there and play and the same with the guys from hermeto's band like jubino santos he gave me lessons with we'd hang out and it was like you know really really generous of those guys we just play and also the other guys in the band like you know michael who's in my band he'd like go and hang out with victor bailey you know as you do or mike stern and that's how we learn and there was a real vibe of like a transatlantic um connection with british jazz musicians american jazz musicians were kind of like we'd all gather and then 
the same bands will come back every year so then you make friendships mm -hmm. and um they'd often ask you to sit in like i sat in with betty carter i still can't believe i did that yeah. <laughs> I sat in with betty carter. And she invited me to move to new york and then she said to me she goes she goes how else am i going to show you how to do what we do I can't do it by osmosis. You need to come to New York. And she, she passed away, actually. Mm. So that never materialised. But that, I mean, that's like, you can't really get that from a textbook. No, I think that's so important. The real, the real deal. Sorry, Zoe, sorry. Yeah. No, no, absolutely the same, Nikki. Just like, you know, I mean, after I studied all the classical stuff, I'd be like, okay, how do I get to play, the, play jazz? So it's the same as Nikki, going up to musicians who I'd heard gig and just ask them and say, can I have a piano lesson? Can you tell me something about, you know, I met Julian Joseph and same with you, Nikki. Like he gave me, you know, um, we used to meet up in the, the Steinway showroom, you know, there. And there was like loads of, yeah, <laughs> when Nikki and I rehearsed last, that's where I last saw Nikki. But you know, he would, yeah, like, and I would learn, he'd say, oh, go away and, and learn some Bob Powell or go and, he gave me a whole list of albums. He took me to um, Tower Records in the, in the basement of Tower Records on Oxford Street. It doesn't exist anymore, but you know, that's where the jazz records were. And um, he gave me a whole list of albums to buy. It wasn't like now he had the internet, you have access to every possible thing that you could imagine you want to listen to, but then you had to go and buy the album. So then I had a whole list of albums to buy. I'd work my way through them. I'd learn people's solos of all the great jazz musicians. And whenever they came to town or whoever came to town, you know, I'd just go and hear them. I like Nikki, go and ask for piano lessons, go and try and just absorb as much information as possible. And he introduced me to actually um, Joanne Bakim, you know, wonderful uh, yeah. American piano player. Um, yeah. And eventually, ultimately went to America yeah. to study with her. I mean, you know, how amazing is that? I went to Berkeley College and she just happened to be the piano teacher there. So I was very lucky in that respect. So yeah, uh, even though I came to Jad late, uh, yeah, still making up for it. <laughs> so we've got James whose birthday is today and I think you would like to head off shortly to have a little bit of a celebration. So let's invite James on because James it follows on very nicely your question from what we've just been talking about with Leo uh, stay with us Leo don't disappear it's an accumulative thing we'll bring everyone on one by one over to you James by the way people watching everybody that's um, asking their questions are all pianists so we've invited four of NYJC's pianists to come and uh, meet Nikki and Zoe and if anyone watching has got any questions then do put them in the comments box because uh, they get forwarded to us by Nick, our programme manager. So over to you, James, and happy birthday. I'm putting a party hat or whatever that symbol is for your birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd say in the in like the midst of all the the playing and really improvising and everything, how do you really discipline yourselves to practice and you know really kind of focus on some things that you want to improve? Really. And maybe Nikki first this time. Thanks for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry, it wasn't intentional. I was just getting a bit of a groove thing going. <laughs> and here you go. No, um, to be honest, that, that's a brilliant question. I don't even know if I can answer that. I think it's always, I think it's always a journey. All aspects of music are a journey. And as you change and evolve as a person, so does your practice. And that becomes with any kind of practice, whether that's a sport, a spiritual practice, cooking, playing music. One thing I will say to you is don't overdo it, but just have focused segments of time where you know what you want the outcome to be. And then also try to disassociate yourself with the emotional baggage that that can bring. Because sometimes if we're doing stuff that we know is our weak point, we often beat ourselves up like, oh man, you should have had this together X amount of uh, months ago or two years ago, or but you didn't got it, you're so bad. And then you just end up focusing on that rather than, and then that becomes something that you've actually practiced. So you, you're focusing and ingraining this thing that is negativity. So in a way, that's the challenge to come across to, to yourself and just be like, right, I need to practice, I don't know, it might be playing giant steps. So, you know, slow it down, make sure that you uh, have some inspiration of the recording of somebody that you really love playing it, rather than it just being a textbook, always refer to the audio. The discipline aspect of it, I would just say, it's like anything. If you do it every day, if you do something for five minutes every day, it's literally better than doing it. So 10 minutes every day is better than doing it for an hour on a Sunday. It's the same amount of time during the week, including the day off. But just that regularity of doing something. And, you know, there's that whole saying that says it's called eat the frog. 
So if there's a big plate of food and it's got all your favorite stuff on there, but it's got a frog on there, if you eat the frog first, it's out of the way, you can enjoy the rest of the meal, yeah? So it's the same with practice. Like, you know, if you, <laughs> so it's cracking up. But, you know, it's the same thing. The same like it's, you know, playing giant steps. Do that for five minutes. Don't beat yourself up. Just do it, get it out of the way. You know what I mean? Then you can play something that you like and because it's still got to be rewarding. So you have to kind of trick yourself, like, you know, difficult thing, reward, you know? And be kind always to yourself because practice kindness because then you're going to, also practice that just as a general way of being to yourself because a lot of musicians can beat themselves up about practice and then they hate playing and they'll do a gig and then afterwards they'll be like oh man I was terrible I hated that we all do it but the more we practice self-love and kindness that's also going to reflect in our musicianship as well and it will reflect in the way that we relate to the other musicians that we work with absolutely so yeah they uh, we were listening to uh, i was listening to some of the rhythm section um videos from the summer school and it was really interesting hearing uh, sam watts talk about bill evans and how he would often take six weeks over a new piece he would really you know really inside out zoe what, what about yourself and uh, practice? I think, well, i've got <laughs> I've kind of got two answers to, to your question it's like for me pre-children and post children <laughs> my you know because um you know, when I was younger, I used to very much divide up my practice time, like Nikki was saying, into sections. So I clearly knew. So I'd like to start off with, you know, very much just warming up fingers, exercises like classical exercises or just scales, whatever, just kind of basic. You're not really thinking, you're just kind of playing. And then transcription was a massive part of my learning, you know, and that really deep, deeply connects you to the music. You're listening, you're not writing, it's not writing down transcribing, it's really listening, absorbing, learning to play like the greats uh, who play jazz. Um, it doesn't have to be piano players, it can be any instrumentalist, but you know, you're really absorbing what's going on and play along with records. So that it's not just um, kind of random time, it's actually, you know, the time's moving and you're playing with it. So you have that connection. And then you know, composition as well, like, expressing yourself so trying to find something that you want to do so it has meaning to you you're finding your own voice through the music and then so and then just learning repertoire so learning jazz tunes um so you've got all those different areas and you sort of divide it up and you can be really <laughs> if this is really the hardest thing to do is to be honest with yourself about mm -hmm. what you've actually achieved so I would write like I say a weekly plan, you know, because when you've got lots of time on your hands, it's really hard to sort of narrow it down. Um, so I have this plan each week. I've done like half an hour scales, half an hour learning about course, half an hour this, you know, an hour transcription. And so I would write it down. And then at the end of the day, I go, well, did I actually do that? I was like, no, I had a cup of tea then actually. <laughs> you know? So it's like being honest about, and, and then, you know, you get to know your own playing and, what your weak points are, what you need to work on, you know, what, how you really play. And then also a big part of it was to record myself, record yourself. And yeah. then you have to be honest, you have to hear, you know, what you're doing. You have to make yourself listen to yourself because um, it's all very well inside your head thinking you sound like Thelonious Monk, but until you hear yourself, you don't know. <laughs> you know? Um, so that's a big part of it. And, so that's what I used to do before I had two kids running around. And now, you know, very much when I do get a spare five minutes, because um, I'm always thinking about music, I'm always like listening to things, but it's very hard. It's, it's harder now to get near the actual instrument. Um, but now it's more about going back to pieces I love, piano players I love. So like this week, I was listening to some Mulgrew Miller. There's an album called um, Getting to Know You. So there's, you know, some great tunes on there that I really like. So if I have a moment, I just try and, then I'm trying to learn repertoire, you know, trying to learn pieces um, and then go back to transcriptions I've already done years ago and see how much of it in there, see what I can use for myself to, you know, really make little phrases my own. So one thing Julie and Joseph told me years ago, you know, make a little, little notebook of phrases, you know, that become your own, turn them upside down, invert them, do them in all these 12 keys. You know, that's one thing I'm terrible at, playing things in all 12 keys, you know, <laughs> should be able to do that, but it's not something, you know, unless you're doing it every day, unless you're working with um, instrumentalists, you play in 
different keys, you know, um, it's just it's good discipline. And in lockdown, especially, you know, because, you know, musicians, we've not been really gigging in, in the same way that we were. So it's made you think about different things. I've been playing a lot of electric bass, actually. So my head's been sort of turned upside down. It's been fantastic. And, um, and then when you come back to the piano, you see it in a very different way as well. And, you know, just learning pieces that I wouldn't necessarily have had a chance to learn if lockdown hadn't happened, you know, listen to things on the radio. So I've always wanted to play that tune. I'm just gonna learn it now, this is great. You know, my son who's six, he's a drummer. So I just hang out with him and, you know, <laughs> but he makes me learn stuff that I would never have learned before. So yeah, practice is a, but like Nikki said, yeah, don't beat yourself up. But just the main thing for me is to have fun. You've got to love it. You've really got to enjoy doing it. Um, and right. play. what an amazing instrument I love it <laughs> well, maybe Oscar would you join us because you've got a lovely first question and this one is for both of you as well no. so over to you Oscar nice yeah thank you nice to see you too hi guys uh my first question is which musician has had the greatest impact on your playing and why so maybe Zoe first this time well gosh uh that's a that's a hard one to answer because there's so many Piano players, the very first musician who made me think I want to learn um, what they're doing was Horace Silver. There's an album, Song for My Father, that, that track, Song for My Father. Um, I learned his solo on that and then subsequently Herbie Hancock. But then, you know, in terms of influence, it's very, it's very hard because I'm always being influenced by everything and everybody. <laughs> So, but in terms on a human level, I suppose Joanne Bakin, because she taught me, Nikki, because she, you know, inspired me, but for years, no, seriously, Nikki, don't pull that face. <laughs> no, but you know, you get inspired by people and going to see people and um, hearing their music in a live situation and interacting with people. So it's not just about listening to records and learning the records, it's real human interaction as well. You know. Nikki, what do you think? <laughs> um, yeah, it's weird. My journey is always is is always been a bit uh, it's been a bit nuts. Um, I would say probably one of the most influential musicians, pianist for me, has been McCoy Tyner. Um, and I got to meet McCoy several times. We became mates actually, which was for me unbelievable. I could have like that was great we, he, he um heard my heard me playing and would be like really i oh, see so someone's putting yes the events putting yes yes McCoy. um and really encouraged me a, a lot you know like a lot of those old school guys they would teach you without even kind of showing you anything and just teach you just by putting ideas into your head planting seeds you know and um, Hermeta Pascual really inspired me as great Brazilian composer and keyboard player is completely bonkers. Um, I used to just totally, when I, one of my early journeys was just all free music. I was obsessed with Cecil Taylor and I used to listen to Cecil Taylor to actually chill out. That tells you a lot about <laughs> as a teenager, right? <laughs> and I was like really into the whole free movement like Albert Ayla and all those guys. And there's a lot of freedom still within my music because you know, I love, I love free jazz as just as much as anything else, but I love the discipline of like McCoy and all of that. Joanne Brackeen as well. Like I never got to uh, study with, jo with Joanne Brackeen like Zoe did. So by osmosis, I'm hoping to absorb some Joanne through Zoe. But um, <laughs> you know, she was one of that, what I couldn't believe when I heard her play and I'm just like, wow. And she had five children, I think four children. And that to me as a woman, I was just like, damn, that's amazing, you know? Mm -hmm. She's uh, got all those kids and she's also playing to a very, very high level. It's possible, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, um, and then Keith Jarrett, I love Keith Jarrett. I mean, I just, every time I've seen Keith play, I'm just like I'm amazed by him. I actually went up to him and asked for lessons and got a very rude response. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, listen, I, of course I don't teach. Listen to my, I literally waited outside the Royal Festival Hall for him for about an hour and a half, two hours after his gig. And he came out, no one else was there. It was like, you know, before social media and stuff, but I was just like, I wanted to see if he could give me a of what I was in town. <laughs> and yeah, he was like, no, nope, I don't give lessons. Just um, just listen to my albums. And he's right, he's right. And uh, you know, they, they are, he's, all of his uh, music on albums, is, that is a lesson in itself. So yeah, there's probably, like, there are loads more, loads more. Zoe as well, obviously, a great inspiration to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
too many too many to mention too many to mention yeah. going to invite ben to come and join us now and then after that we're going to let james leapfrog over and do his second question so he can get away for his birthday uh, celebration so ben first of all if you'd come and join us hello ben nice to see you over to you um please could i ask when you are recording how hands-on are you with mixing and do you normally finish tunes in one take or do you combine multiple takes on your albums? Um, well, I'm involved in every aspect of the recording process, very much so. And um, yeah, it's not always first take, one take, you know, we'll cut in if a piano solo doesn't go right, you know, put it over the top. Um, yeah, I mean, I've made, what, six albums now, so they've all been very different processes, different recording studios, different musicians, different engineers, um, different miking techniques on the piano, different pianos, obviously, different studios. Um, so, yeah, I, in terms of the actual um, end product, it's, uh, I see albums, I mean, it's very different these days, like, I, I like making albums, so it's a journey. I very much think about in the studio which pieces are going to go in which order on the album. I mean, people listen to music in a very different way now online. You can just pick a track and listen to a track without any context of what album that came from, mm. you know. But for me, in the, the you know the albums that I have made, they're very much a a story from beginning to end. So um, you know, in the editing process. You know, I'm very much thinking about that, uh, how this track will work with the next track. You know, um, maybe if the piano solo or the bass solo or the drum solo is too long for that particular context, then, you know, I edit down. Um, or, you know, some, if you're recording um, and there's enough separation between the instruments, then, yeah, you can cut in. Some situations are more live where you can't, like I've put out a live album that I did at Pizza Express. There's no, you can't, you can't edit in that. So I just had to put out warts and all, you know, it was just like, that's what I did. So that's when my, what went out. Um, you know, with the solo piano album, again, I tried to play as if I was doing a gig. Like a lot of the time, you know, I'll book a studio for two days or three days. And the first two days, you're just getting used to the studio, getting used to the sound. And then you do your very best work in like the last half hour or the last hour you know <laughs> you'll just go right and well now i'm going to do the now i'm going to do the album i'm just going to run it like a gig and pretend there's an audience in the room and we're just going to play and that happens on the album melting pot that i did um you know most of the stuff that went on the album was done in the last hour of the studio you know of a two or i think it was two day or maybe even maybe even three day recording session and, you know, same with my solo piano album. I just ran it like a gig at the end. There might have been a few bits that we needed to edit out, you know, because they would have been really embarrassing if I put them on the, <laughs> on the album. But, you know, because, you know, we're quite particular. It's hard. It's really hard. That's why I say when you're practicing, really listen to yourself, because it is such a difficult thing to, to hear yourself back, you know, especially if you're, the, you're putting the albums out yourself, you're the producer, you're the musician, you're the, you know, you're doing everything. And to take a step back and hear yourself as an artist is a very difficult thing, you know, because you have all that head stuff going on about, you know, you've got, you know, you have to have some level of removal from how you played. So it's a really good idea not to listen to it for a while. You know, I immediately want to hear it the minute I played it. I'm like, oh, how did that go? But actually you can't because your head, you just, yeah, you'll mess your head up. <laughs> so. Yeah. It's just like also it's a little bit like being a curator, isn't it? A painting in itself looks amazing on in isolation, but it's then hanging it in context with the others when you're doing an album as yeah. well. Uh, Nikki. Yeah, I would say that, um, I mean, I haven't recorded as many albums under my own name. In fact, I've had one album that's come out from under my own name, um, Solo Gemini. And for me, I've been working with a sound engineer that um, I was working with for a very long time and um, just in, in, in various contexts as, you know, a um, bit of programming and stuff. Anyway, he, he's brilliant. And you have to trust somebody when you're mixing with them. And yet you have to trust their judgment. And I don't think it's always about telling an engineer what to do, but listening to what their opinion is, is as well. 
because obviously they hear sounds in a completely different way. I mean, you know, I know sound engineers that listen to a mix and I'm like, oh, that's, um, what do you think of that, uh, that solo? And they're like, I didn't actually hear it. They're listening to frequencies. They're not even listening to the music. They're not listening to how, if it sounds good, they're listening to whether or not that frequency is, you know, resonating at a certain point. And that's a deep level of listening because these guys, you know, they, their ears are like superhuman. So, you know, sonically my, you know, my, my solo piano album, we, we mix that album together and I was in on the complete mixing process. And if you hear um, the end of the first track, six as one, if you listen to the very, very last note, you'll hear that that it's just like, you know, it's an audio file, just like, oh, that was great. That, you know, because the, the, the way that we've got the mix on the very, very last note, it's deep. You've got to turn it up quite, quite high to really hear it. But we wait for that whole note to, to, to fade out on, a, on, on, that, on that first track because it's just, it's been recorded so beautifully. The frequencies are, are so cool. So, yeah, you've got to have it from a musical perspective where you feel that's representative of the sounds that you're hearing in your head. But um, you've also got to really trust that engineer because their expertise is something that, you know, unless you're a sound engineer too, you're going to be hearing it from a completely different place. So it's about the trust within that relationship. Um, and that takes a while. You don't, you don't always get that luxury of knowing that engineer. Um, so then that's where it can become a bit of a tension if you go into a studio and it's someone else's session and you know, you're not, you're not sure what they're going to do with it, but then you kind of just got to give that away as well and, and just trust. And if it comes out it, good or bad or whatever, you can't really control it. You can't control every aspect of that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that is just the way it is when you do a session and you've got to walk away and say, that was a moment, it was beautiful, I'm, I'm gone, I'm going, go, I'm going to Starbucks or whatever, wherever you're going. Don't go to Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> did either of you um, have producers on the projects you do or did you produce your I own? I co-produced mine. Um, you know, my manager was there all the time as well. I mean, he's fantastic. And then between him and um, the sound engineer, who co the sound engineer and I co-produced the album too. And uh, Tim Adnett, he's absolutely brilliant, brilliant musician and, as well. And um, they basically uh, got all the mics and stuff and uh, all, set them all up. And we had a beautiful room and. Um, we got exactly the mics that we wanted for that particular piano. I chose the piano, I was a whole process. I went down to Auburn six months before and, and played about 12 different pianos and chose the piano I wanted. So I had a quite a lot more control over it than I would do say, like if I just walked into a studio and the piano's already there, you know, I, I, I chose between 12 excellent Steinways and like- oh. <laughs> Yeah, so you'd researched it. Yeah. yeah, we got the yeah. mic that we wanted and they, you know, you know, Neumann Sennheiser kindly just like, so let us have those mics uh, because of the working relationship I have with these two incredible people, my manager and also the sound engineer. I mean, you know, we managed to get the sound I wanted. I'm very happy with the sound of my album, I have to say. It's yeah. one of the first times I've really been happy with the sound of how I sound as a, as a piano player. And I think it's, it's, it's that trust of, that, of, of the relationship and the, and the expertise. Because you, 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 can't, you can't be it, be it all. Some, you know, you have to trust that other people that's their forte yeah. you know like in the in the late 90s early 2000s when people started getting logic on their mac all of a sudden everyone and their dog was a producer and and you were also expected to be able to work logic and be a producer and work pro tools and do all of that and actually there are other there are other dudes that are amazing at that we don't have to do all of that to be yeah. a great musician we just I be mean, a great I, I, yeah it's true it's true nikki yeah, absolutely yeah i wonder I mean, if we could give james the chance to ask his next question so he can then pop off to his little because he's got perfect. family yeah. very kindly waiting so james go for it and then we'll we'll go back to that what we we're just talking about um you know we don't have to be all things to all people james uh, yeah sure um how, how do you prepare for like a big competition like the jazz musician of the year how did you prepare kind of you think are you, are you meaning to give you give advice from a sort of a young from the person that's entering the competition's perspective yeah. or yeah, yeah sure. so and that's great that zoe was one of the judges and nikki was uh, playing as well so zoe because you did the um semi-final first maybe what did you notice and then nikki you could talk a bit more about the you know preparation actually playing in, in the trio as well that'd be great so zoe yeah i mean it's interesting for me because i'm the last two um, uh, 
BBC Young Jazz musician. I was on the judging panel of the finals. So that's a very different thing. Cause when you're in the, you know, when you see the, the final five or however many it is that come through, you're not seeing the whole story, the whole picture of what's going on. Um, and so, you know, it was interesting for me to see the semi-final musicians this year and see the breadth and depth of musicianship that's out there. It's, you know, it's very hard because jazz and music generally, it's not a competitive sport, you know, <laughs> it's music. So by its very nature, it's um, setting you up in a very strange position, um, you know, as judges, as performers, you know, uh, really, if you think of a competition, if you're entering a competition, it's about performance. It's about expressing, expressing yourselves and, you know, personality, your own personality, if that shines through, that's really the most important thing. And your kind of connection to jazz and the history of jazz, but your own place in that. So um, it doesn't matter what instrument or necessarily the, the type of music you're playing, you know, because you get a very short, in, in that particular context of that competition, there's a very short amount of time to show what you do. But uh, as, you know, we were really an audience. I didn't think of myself really as a judge in that sense. I was there to listen and to hear what the musicians would, were doing, were saying, you know, and if you, if you think of it, if you're entering any competition in that, that way, think of it as an, uh, your enjoyment of performing you know, and your communication with the audience, your love of the music, your communication with the other band around, you know, uh, band members. Um, it's, it's a really important part of the music, you know, more than, more than just notes. It's not just notes. It's not about scales. It's not about chords. It's not about what you know. It's about, um, you know, the ones that really got through for me were the ones that made me cry, literally. You know brought a tear to my eye you know because I feel music you know it's something that you can't replace it's like if the musician has moved the energy in the room you start they come into the room something happens when they play you feel differently as an audience member afterwards after hearing them you connect with that person you know it's way beyond anything anybody can teach you it's about it's about you and your communication, what you want to say. So um, I don't know, Nikki, if that's how it, because it was fantastic to see you working with all those musicians and, you know, seeing what they produced on the night of the show, you, you know, in having seen them before, you know, and it was so hard because there were so many brilliant musicians and we couldn't put them all, <laughs> we couldn't put them all through, you know, that was a very tough choice, but um, yeah, Since Nikki. I five were put through Nikki and then what was the what how did that then um what was the next step so they they obviously didn't just suddenly turn up on stage and play with you there was it would have been some preparation might you talk us through after they'd gone from the semi-final what happened then thanks Zoe. Well, I was a semi-final judge in 2018 so um I had an experience of being involved in the competition from that perspective as well um so it's an interesting process and um I would say, in addition to what Zoe is saying, and after everything I, what Zoe said is absolutely how I feel as well. Um, I would say, be your authentic self. And that sounds like a really bad Instagram quote, but it actually is pretty kind of, <laughs> it's quite important to be you, you know, like, you know, Matt Carmichael, the saxophone player, the Scottish guy, he's totally him. I mean, he's, he's Scottish and he plays jazz. And when you hear him, that's what you hear. And yeah. a very really high level, man. He's, he's like, um, you hear where he lives in his music, and you hear and what he loves. So he's like, Brecca meets Jan Garbrecht meets like Scottish Mountain, beautiful stuff. And Deschanel, who won as well. Deschanel, so I was saying his name wrong. You know, he's got a bit of reggae in there because that's his roots. And he grew up hearing and feeling and playing that. And it goes into this reggae groove and it's authentic. You're like, yes. If you try to play stuff that is, uh, all the other great guys were great too. Um, but just to move it on, you know, um, if you play stuff that is authentically you, so, you know, if you really, really love Bill Evans, that's your thing, and, you know, you connect with that, and that's within your soul, do that. Don't try and do Oscar Peterson and play really, really fast. 
if that's not you, you know, or, but if that is really you, then do that, you know, because what people would always sense is authenticity and the genuine nature of you, you know, if you play it as a, um, as a, a competitor, it's always going to come across as a sport and that mm -hmm. will also be a barrier to engaging with the band. Mm -hmm. So luckily on this fantastic final, all of those great individual musicians, you know, Alex, Ralph, uh, Keelan, uh, Deschanel and Matt, they were all very authentically themselves. So they came in with uh, everything prepared. See, this is the really key thing, have really good charts. There is no substitute for having an excellent chart, yeah? And I watched the live stream with Alex and Asha, two fantastic musicians the other week. And they said the same thing, like don't have like loads of little tiny dots where it's like, for the piano player, A flat minor seven sharp 11 with a slash B flat, possibly you could play this. Like when you're sight reading something, it needs to be clear. Yeah. That's clear charts. And you know, to be honest, the cats that had the clearer charts, they, it felt like, like Ralph Porritt had incredible charts. His charts were so well thought out, but we already knew when he came in the room, we didn't have to worry about the arrangement. We could just play. So he got two hours. Everybody gets two hours. The Thursday, one hour with me and Mark and Michael and one hour on Friday. That is it. You don't get no more than that. That's your allocated slot, okay? So what you want is to give, you'll have to give those charts to the BBC in advance. Not, I mean, you know, we got them a week or two weeks in advance. It wasn't that long before. So then we do our homework. So we're ready for when we get into the rehearsal room because that's what we do as musicians, right? We're ready. Doesn't matter if you have to stay up all night. And learn that stuff you have to be ready for rehearsal but those people who had the really really clear charts and handed them in pretty much immediately as soon as they were asked that meant that we got more time to just gel and vibe yeah. so we could just yeah. feel the music and we weren't on page as much and all yeah. of those things so i would say start your charts and that's not just for a competition just in general as musicians when when you go into rehearsal have your stuff so then the freedom can just leap off the page yeah. Very you know important. what I mean? The, the yeah. notes are important. And if you have to spend half the rehearsal saying, oh, actually, I meant to write the G sharp in that bar or, oh, I forgot repeat marks. It's, it's a waste of time, you know, have your charts organised. Right. Absolutely, Nikki. Yeah. And we're going to let you uh, fly like the wind so that you can go and see your family. And um, can we all give James a big happy birthday wave and a big round of applause? Yeah. Have a lovely rest of the evening. Um, and what I'm going to suggest with the rest of the questions is that if we just do one one each. So, um, Leo, might you ask your question? Um, I think I just sent you a little message. See you soon, James. I'll send you a little message. Might you ask that to Zoe? And then Ben's going to ask a question which is specifically for Nikki. So over to you, Leo. So um, when, like, it's really easy to overplay as a pianist when, like, or at least I find when I'm comping or accompanying someone and comping over their solo, especially the bassist. Um, and I was curious if you could give any advice or any kind of pianistic principles on when you go into a jam session and not trying your okay. mission not to overplay. So, so the first point is that you said when you um, comp over someone's solo. So that in itself <laughs> is just, <laughs> okay. So your comp, your comp, like it, it's communication, it's dialogue. So you have to, it's like a conversation. You have to wait for someone to speak. And then when there's the gap in a conversation, then you can like say your little piece and then, you know, and it's about going with that person. So don't be afraid to just not play. You don't have to play. You know, the bass player might just want to play on their own. You know, the rest of the band might just, you can just stop. You know, there's no need for you to just play randomly if you don't, you're not feeling it, you know, or if they're not calling for it. And if you are going to play, then make it a, a dialogue, make it relevant. You, the thing is about listening, you have to be listening. So you can't be inside your own head panicking about what you're going to play. The music will come to you if you're hearing a line in the in the bass that you want to answer or support you know that's the main that's the main when someone's soloing they're soloing and you're just supporting them in that i think that's probably the the most important thing that i could say Brilliant. on that thanks zoe i'll just add to that but just one quick question leo do you know what comping is an abbreviation of uh not really have a guess uh, 
I thought it was short for accompanying. Right, and most people do think that. It's actually short for complimenting. There you go. Have you heard that concept? No, I haven't. You're good to go. <laughs> ben, over to you, Lovie. I'm just only just mindful of time, that's all. So, uh, but that's br brilliant. Thanks a lot, Leo, Zoe, Nikki. Over to you, Ben. Hi, uh, Nikki. I was going to ask, what role does your manager have in your career and what defines a manager in the jazz world? Good question. Um, I actually think, first and foremost, the most, the most important thing to do at your, the stage of you guys' uh, career, once you start gigging, is get yourself an accountant. Accountants are really important. They're going to keep your stuff in order, make sure you pay your tax on time, make sure you get your paperwork together. It's boring as hell, but you need to have it. OK, then if you make it big time, which is very easy to do, you, you might just overnight become big time. Right. Not easy to do, but it very easily happens very easily. Then you've got that trusted relationship with that person that can suddenly, you know, if you go from one tax bracket to another, they can sort you out. And that is going to free you up for creativity. You know, first things first is your accountant. Then what you need to do is find an excellent sound engineer, stroke tour manager. And the reason why you need to do that is because um, basically that's gonna be your liaison between the club, the musicians, um, the staff at the club. That's your, that's your um, calling card. That's your kind of representation of you. That's, that's how you're gonna get a reputation as well of how you're interacting with uh, the whole club. So if you have a problem with the sound and then you speak to your sound engineer, that's great. If you have a problem with the sound and there's a big argument with the guys at the club, you might not get called back for the gig. Have a really good team around you. The tour and um, the tour manager thing is very, very important because if you're on the road, you need the cat who's going to make sure that everyone gets up at 3.30 to make sure they're in the lobby for four to get that flight to go from Prague to, you know, Austria. You need to make sure that they're going to do that. And that's not you because you can't be creative and be, you know, an artist and deal with all of that. Yes, you can do it, we're capable of doing it, but you really shouldn't have to do that. And, mm. you know, so employing somebody, meaning giving up some of your money or factoring that into the budget is, is a very good call. And then your manager comes into the scene. So you have your accountant, you have your sound engineer stroke tour manager, and then you have your, your manager. And the manager really is the person that um, you, well, let me quote Ian Bellamy here. Ian Bellamy had the perfect way of summing this up. He said, you're going to pay for it one way or the other. You're either going to pay for it by experience or you're going to pay for it for experience. All right. So you're either going to pay for experience or you're going to pay by experience. So if you have a manager, they're usually much more seasoned than you. They've done the journey with other artists before. So they have... An, um, an amazing recollection of things that can go right or wrong and they can foresee stuff before you can you know so what you have to do is be prepared to give up a percentage of your income in order to pay them and uh you know not everybody can uh, will want to do that actually not everyone will want to give up a percentage of their income but i've always found it very useful to have a manager and uh, this the fourth person on your team that you're going to need is a lawyer and what you get by having an amazing manager is usually the connections to incredible lawyers as well. And this is all a trustworthy team. So it all comes in stages, you know, and if you're doing a gig in a dog and duck for 30 quid, you might not necessarily need um, a whole team, but you definitely need an accountant to keep your, your tax and your money in uh, order. And this, this follows on to some of the things we've talked about with the young musicians that we work with, that not everybody necessarily goes on to be a player. They might choose then to look at different areas of the, of the scene that they might want to um, lead on. Like, for example, Ben, you're very proactive in the studio, aren't you? And you do lots of recording and that side of things. We've got one question that's come in from Facebook, and then um, I was going to give Oscar the big finale uh, to come up with his surprise last question, which I think you should ask both um, Zoe and uh, Nikki, but Zoe, there's a question that's come in 
from one of our young musicians and she's a, a, a violinist and she's come from a very a classical background having said that she's got incredible ears and plays like Stefan Grappelli and it's very quick and picks up she's got that sort of gypsy style playing really already under her fingers um, but um, she's actually sent quite a long question so I'm going to edit it down to get to the nub of it which is uh, if you chose again now would you study jazz at conservatoire or would you still study classical? Oh gosh, what a good question. Um, oh, well, well, in my day, there wasn't really, I didn't have a choice. Yeah, I couldn't have studied, but yeah, I think I would do exactly the same that I did because my learning was in life and through going to gigs and listening to records. So for me, that is the way to learn jazz. And have, did you come across much improvisation through the lens of a, a classical musician? Um, that's one of the, the the other part of the question was, um, you know, do you think that uh, classical musicians should improvise more, and should there be training in that? Just wondered if you yourself had had any experience. Yeah, not necessarily training, but there should definitely be an awareness that you're allowed to do that, or it's possible, or that has always been done through history. So like Beethoven would improvise; it's nothing new, you know, throughout history. Musicians. It's just the fact that classical music by definition has to be written down if you want someone else to play it, you know, in centuries to come. But, um, you know, there's no, absolutely no reason why classical musicians can't improvise. It should be a part of what you do. You know, music isn't just something that you play that someone else has written. You know, why should it be like that? You know, there are, you know, piano concertos, there's always, there's space in concertos for the soloist to improvise. You know, so why yeah. not? It's no different. It's just a different, different language. Um, and the fact that you have to play with an orchestra, yeah, it has to be certain elements have to be written down, you know, but um, improvisation is just a part of life. It's part of music. It should be in, you know, it's not just, I'm not, not just classical, not just jazz, but all sorts of music from all over the world. There's improvisation, you know, it's communication. And I think we're getting very genre fluid, aren't we, uh, these days? People sort of just ebbing and flowing and bringing ingredients from all the areas into different genres. But I'm it's not an understanding of also what improvisation actually yeah. is. It's not just kind of wiggling your fingers around, you know? <laughs> Um, so ask, uh, the big the big finale come on hit us with your question and then um we're going to say i'm going to get nick to come in quickly after that to, to explain how people can sign up to our newsletter and then we'll say a bon a bon nuit but first of all over to you oscar it's going very well everybody by the way it's a really enjoyable conversation sorry it's overrun but i hope you don't mind i think it's really worth it and i know the viewers are just staying and enjoying it hello everybody <laughs> Oscar. <laughs> Thanks, Izzy. So this question links to solo piano because I know both of you are really well experienced in that area. Um, so I was going to ask if there was one thing that you would advise an aspiring jazz pianist to work on when it comes to solo piano, what would it be? Um, so, yeah, well, solo piano, you know, it is basically you've got a left hand and a lot of piano players don't use their left hand very much <laughs> so you know solo piano you have I mean you have inside the piano you have right down the end middle high you have you can use your elbows you can use every you can use every aspect you know and also the depth the, the quality of the sound look um, expressively at how the sound is being produced because you could play one note and you but you can play it in so many different ways you know explore all the sonorities that you have at your fingertips again it's not just about learning the notes I hear a lot of musicians not just piano players just playing um not in a very deeply grounded way into the sound of the instrument you know this is why I love playing with Nikki because she gets right into the piano you know it's a very deep sort of groove it's a very deep sound so there's just there's more beyond um just the notes so solo piano for me I'm still exploring you know what is possible on the instrument like every tune I do I try and get a, a, you know explore a different aspect of the piano a different aspect of the sound a different aspect of the harmony and solo piano, I could just go on and on and on, you know, exploring, really use it as a chance to work on different areas of your 
playing and draw from different um, sources of music as well. So not just jazz, you know, listen really broadly. So I listen to everything in, in my house, music from all around the world. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Um, I, 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 it's a really great question. And it's um, difficult to answer actually in a lot of ways without just playing. So um, for me, I started doing solo piano pretty much from beat one. And I think that's because when I when I heard like Cologne concerts, uh, Keith Jarrett, I was like, yeah, that's possible. You can actually just play piano in front of a big audience, and and they'll dig it, you know, if it's if it's happening. Um, it's difficult to not replicate what Keith Jarrett did on those concerts. But then the whole thing is Keith Jarrett was like, I'm not going to play Cologne concerts again. So I think if Keith Jarrett said he's not going to do it. Mm -hmm. Anybody else, quite frankly, you know, <laughs> we should leave that alone and uh, and try to explore what, what you really say. So, you know, it's uh, that you can try to replicate, you know, like playing a bass line like a bass player and all of that. But actually, like Zoe said, it's much better to get into the sounds of the piano and try and make it sing in all of those different kinds of. Um, subcategories of a composition so like you want to play the bass line like a bass player but actually you want to play it like the sound of the piano as well if that makes sense for me music is always without sounding too hippy trippy and getting my crystals out i've got a crystal here somewhere nice too right but you know it's, it's literally to me music is a healing force right and when i'm going in front of an audience and i'm playing a, a solo piano piece i'm very much coming from a connection and a healing place and that's not to say that everybody should do that. That's just that's just my thing, and that's where what that's why I play, and that's what I feel. And for me, that is predominantly why I go on stage and will play a solo piano piece. And it's about getting into that zone. And I think people quite often miss the point of Keith Jarrett when they hear the technique and all of the chops, and they miss the actual message that he's just really channeling. Mm -hmm. You know, the you know universe yeah and, and uh, as ian carr said he used to both teach myself to teach both myself and zoe as well and lots of other cats on the scene julian Joseph, mark and michael mondays all those guys um you know keith jarrett he said that he interviewed keith jarrett and keith jarrett said every time he plays it's like a form of prayer and this is not to say that you have to is a, any type of prayer it's a prayer you have with the universe mm -hmm. you know so to me i've always approached music in that way and it's even more of um, a prerequisite when you're playing solo or you have even more command over that energy because there's no other energy to take into consideration other than the energy that's in the room, rather than having to take into consideration the other energy of the other musicians too and what that chemistry brings. And with that chemistry, it can either ignite or it can be a disaster. It depends on the, on, on the vibe. Hopefully it's always going to ignite. Um, so yeah, that's in a kind of hippy trippy nutshell where I'm coming from. Right. And, and then there's also like, you know, harmony, rhythm and, and chops and all of those things, they will have to be considered. Otherwise it's just like a bit floaty and you're playing in A minor all the time and, and, and you're crying. And then that's a bit more, <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? You can't just do that every gig, a couple of gigs. Then, you know. Nick, might you come and join us? It'd be really lovely to, we're gonna bring the, this evening to a close, first of all, Ooh. have you enjoyed the conversation? Oh, it's been incredible. Just so lovely just to hear and, and just resonate with so much that is that is being said. It's it's so, so lovely. And I think just looking at the responses uh, from everyone watching um, and everyone who stayed with us, you know, it's been it's been really beneficial to a, a lot of people. So next week we've got Mark and Michael M Mondesier, Mondesi hey. joining us. And uh, and we're going to be talking about uh, we'll, we'll talk a bit about the Young Jazz Musician of the Year, but also that relationship between bass and drums and the sort of things that they did to develop that skill. And so obviously, Nikki, your your name will be mentioned many times because you've known them for quite a while, haven't you? When how old were you when you first met them? I met Mark when I was sixteen at my sixth form. My sixth form was incredible. It was at States it's sixth form in Islington, right? And um, they had we had a jazz course for four weeks and Julian Joseph, John Toussaint, Mark Mondesi and Wayne Batchelor came for four weeks and we played and it was amazing. I was like, oh my gosh, like they, they know that I love jazz, but it wasn't just about me, it was about everybody, but I loved it. And then the next week we had a project with John Cage who came to my school, John Actual Cage. Oh, yeah, way. John Cage and I played in front of him in my school. My like how, how mental, oh, right? Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah right? Mental. I've got it on video as well. I've got actual proof. 
Then the week after that is our Christmas bash. We've got Ian Shaw, Leanne Carroll joining us, which would be great. So do tune in for that. That'll be the last one, the 16th, until we come back on the 13th of January. But um, how do people hear about what we're doing, especially with the summer school? And we've got lots of things up our sleeve with this joining us online and doing the blended learning. So how do you how yeah. do people know about that? So if you'd like to be more involved in MRJC's activities as a young musician, a music leader, a practitioner, or an audience member, you can sign up for MRJC's newsletter, which goes out four times a year. And it's uh, the link to do that is nationalyouthjazz.co.uk forward slash sign up. And then also, um, Nikki, particularly from having been involved in working with MIJC in the different areas, will vouch for the fact that we're very committed to making sure that all, all young musicians of all backgrounds get access to working with us, no matter what their financial background. So we've got, a, we work very hard with the bursary scheme. And obviously this year with the um, COVID and lots of parents being self-employed and not being able to pay the enrolment fees, which are already very reasonable, but we've had, we have supported a, a larger volume of young musicians this year than ever before. So we're a little depleted for 2021. So if people would like to donate to the bursary, how does one go about that? Yes, so to support MYJC in, in its commitment to making our work accessible to all young musicians, it's nationalyjazz.co.uk forward slash donate. Brilliant. Well, we've just had a little lovely little uh, message from Zoe thanking us for the chat and wishing us a uh, happy Christmas. But I think uh, Zoe and Nikki, before we go, if you'll join me, first of all, in thanking Leo. Thank you very much, Leo. Yeah. Oscar. Thank you. Ben. Thanks. Thank happy you. birthday, James. Well done to everybody that's watching, but obviously we wouldn't have had this conversation and it certainly wouldn't. I think you guys will join me in a big round of applause to thank, please, Zoe Rahman and Nikki Yeo. It was a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much. Thanks. Can I, can I do a cheeky plug of my gig? I don't know if I've mentioned this yet. Right, Go for um, it. Playing at Ronnie Scott's January the 4th. It's live, so you can come into the club. It's not like streams, it's live in person. You can have chips, you can have a burger, you can have a drink, or you can just watch the music, but it's going to be live. January yeah. is limited to feel social, socially distant. But um, please do come along. I would love to see any of you at the, at the show. It will be amazing to meet you all in person. Please come along. January 4th, it's up on the website, Ronnie Scott's website. Please do come along. Zoe, have you got anything planned for the early part of next year? I can't top that, Nikki, I'm afraid. I'm looking forward to our next, when's our next gig? That's what I'm on it now. <laughs> we had so many great ones. Can't, we were about to do this little mini tour and then it was just like, goodbye, COVID, port by yeah. hat. So yeah, sorry. So, actually, no, sorry, I lie. sorry, Izzy. I do actually have, I'm going, apparently I'm going to Germany in June. So, you know, if I can get a flight and if Brexit doesn't get in the way, I shall really? be in Hamburg, yeah, in June. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to sign off with something that um, I don't know if any of you saw the Tom Kerridge programme recently about um, saving pubs and then obviously COVID hit. But um, he brought, he raised a really good point, which apparently in the sort of social side of things, it, there's a change. People aren't saying um, socially distancing anymore because we are socially wanting to stay close. So we're just physically distancing. And mm -hmm. I think that's true of everything that we do through all the music we make, whether it's MIJC or in our own bands and projects. And when the youngsters, I know you've all been meeting since the summer school online and keeping in touch. So I think we're going to wave you all off with that sentiment. Remember, it's not socially distanced, it's physically <laughs> distanced, but we're never far apart because we're musicians and we love playing together. So looking forward to seeing you all in the new year. In the meantime, Nick, thank you very much for facilitating. Thanks, Zoe. Thanks, Nick. Bye. Nice to see you all, Leo, Oscar, Ben. Ciao. <laughs> Bye. Bye.